Hello there. Welcome to this week's um, concept map on how to approach weakness as a presenting complaint. My name is Ling and I'm a foundation doctor working for Nottingham University Hospitals Trust. Um, thank you for participating in um, our week to weeks online teaching. So let's have a head start. This week we'll be approaching weakness. So weakness is a cardinal presentation of neurological diseases, neurological lesions, um, a well taken thorough history and thorough neurological exam will be key to diagnosis. And when you approach weakness, there are two questions you must generally determine and ask yourself: Where is the lesion, and what is the lesion? And I know a lot of students struggle with neurophobia, um, which is basically a fear of. Um, neurology is a subject, but um, you should aim to understand the patient's presentation and not just memorize of signs and diseases. So before one can approach weakness, it is essential to understand basic neuroanatomy and to understand how to perform a basic neurological exam as well. So I'm, I'm going to go in this week and teaching you with the assumption that you will already have understood how to perform a neurological exam and how basic neuroanatomy works, um, such as brain anatomy, the motor homunculus, and at which point your spinal tracts decussate, and as well as your spinal tracts, tracts, your dorsal columns, your corticospinal tracts, and what do they do um, individually. But don't worry if you don't, um, we will and touch about this briefly. So then, um, before we approach weakness, it would be good to have a list of differentials in your head before you explore any presentation in any patients in general. And to do that, we can employ the anatomical approach where we class the differentials according to where the lesion lies anatomically or using the surgical filter. This will be explained in more detail. So then, using the anatomical approach, you can appreciate the list of differentials that could cause weakness, and they are of course class according to where um, the pathology lies anatomically. So as you can see, um, on using the ana anatomical approach, um, the lesions could arise in the brain, brain stem, spinal cord, anterior horn cells, your nerve roots or your peripheral nerves, in your neuromuscular junction, on your muscles. And if you notice, I've highlighted um, brain and brainstem as well as spinal cord in red because they represent your central nervous system. And any lesion arising in those structures will give you an upper motor neuron pattern of weakness. And we will go that into detail soon. So then using the surgical filter, we use the surgical sieve, which is vitamin C, D. And the causes are classed according to their categories of insult. So please feel free to pause this video and peruse this slide further. Try not to memorize, but instead just appreciate, be aware and understand that these differentials exist and they could cause weakness. It's okay if you don't have an exhaustive list in your head and we all start somewhere. So then, let's have a head start. So the first step, first of all, when you approach weakness, always ask yourself, what is the pattern of the weakness that I'm seeing here? Is this an upper motor neuron pattern or lower motor neuron pattern? And to establish that, you will need to perform a full standard neurological exam in your patient, and that's how you'll find out. So in this slide, you can see a table of signs that will help you distinguish if your patient's weakness is predominantly caused by upper motor neuron lesion, which is any lesion arising in the brain, brainstem or spinal cord, or lower motor neuron lesion, which is any lesion arising from structures that exit the spinal cord, beginning from your anterior horn cells down to your basic muscle unit. So knowledge of basic neuroanatomy will be essential to understand why things present the way they are. And as you can see, um, your good reliable clinical findings 
such as tone, reflexes, planters, and fasciculation will be very useful in helping you distinguish um, the pattern. So in upper motor neuron lesions, you will find increased tone and reflexes. Your planters will be upgoing. In lower motor neuron lesions, you will find decreased tone, decreased reflexes, down-going planters, and you will find fasciculations as well. So next. So once you've identified the pattern of weakness, once you've identified is this, if this is predominantly upper motor neuron or lower motor neuron, then it is time to investigate what and where the potential lesions could be in each of those categories. So let's start by exploring an upper motor neuron pattern of weakness. And let's start by exploring the causes and the potentials. So then, in when you approach upper motor neuron and weakness, once you've identified this pattern of weakness, you firstly need to establish the distribution of the weakness. Is it hemiparesis, which is a unilateral involvement of your weakness? Is it paraparesis, quadriplegia, which is a bilateral involvement of weakness? Or is it a bizarre distribution that you cannot make out? We will look into each different, sorry, we will look into each distribution separately in the next few slides. So then, um, if it's hemiparesis, ask yourself what is the onset and time cause of the presentation. If it is hyperacute within seconds to minutes, it is most likely a stroke, TIA. If it's within hours to days, um, you should consider MS, multiple sclerosis, cranial abscess. Um, and if it's within weeks to months, you will need to consider malignancy. Um, and if there's something more sinister going on, look for cranial nerve involvement. So remember if there is an ipsilateral cranial nerve involvement to the weakness, then the lesion lies in the brain. But if the cranial nerve um, involvement is contralateral to the site of the weakness, it is a brainstem lesion. Then, if you have bilateral involvement of weakness, so if you have paraparesis or quadriplegia, ask yourself then, is sensation affected? Is sensation intact? Abnormal sensation would almost always suggest a spinal cord lesion. And remember, with spinal cord lesions, examine for the motor level because you will find lower motor neuron signs at the level of the lesions and upper motor neuron signs below the level of the lesion. So if you examine for your patient's motor level um, in detail, you will be able to locate where the lesion lies in the spinal cord. Or you can just um, request for an MRI spine and find the level of the lesion. So then, in normal sensation, the few differentials to think about would be bilateral brain disease, such as meningioma, hereditary spastic paraparesis, and primary lateral sclerosis. It is a variant. Um, of a family of motor neuron disease. So we are strictly speaking about paraparesis, quadriparesis with normal sensation. So in then in paraparesis, quadriplegia in, uh, with affected or abnormal sensation, ask yourself what aspects of the sensation is predominantly affected. If pain and temperature is predominantly affected, this will point towards your spinal tonic tracts. So it will point towards stringomelia, which is a fluid filled strings, which develops in your spinal cord, and most likely and without a cause really, or sometimes it can be from trauma and it commonly affects your spinal tonic tracts. Um, in weakness, which predominantly affects your vibration and proprioception, um, this would increase the suspicion for SCDC, which is your subacute combined degeneration of spinal cord. And this is from a vitamin B12 deficiency. However, if both aspects of sensation is equally affected, then look for the onset and the time cause. Acute presentations would suggest trauma and it could lead to brown sequat syndrome. And from what I've heard, Brown Sequoia syndrome is very rare, but it could happen. Um, it is essentially your hemisection of your spinal cord. So this is where you will find 
ipsilateral upper motor neuron weakness with ipsilateral loss of vibration sense and proprioception with contralateral loss of pain and temperature. So this will actually nicely reflect the neuroanatomical fact that your spinal thalamic tracts actually cross over or decussate of one to two vertebral levels above the root supply. So then, in subacute presentations, this will suggest MS, epidural abscess, spinal TB, spinal metastasis, bone tumors, um, and well, with that said, um, your meds and your bone tumors um, will could also lead to a chronic presentation as well. So in chronic progressive presentation, um, it will suggest degenerative cervical myelopathy, which will contribute to weakness and sensation loss from chronic compression to the cervical spine. So then urgent neurosurgical referrals advice if you suspect DCM in your patients. The other thing to, to consider um, would be tabis dorsalis, which is neurosyphilis essentially. Then next, we will approach upper motor neuron weakness with a bizarre distribution. And patients with bizarre presentation should get you thinking about multiple strokes, multiple sclerosis, which once again is a diagnosis which is made from lesions disseminated in space and time. So on your imaging, you must find the lesions that are separated, disseminated in space, and you must find them disseminated in time as well. The symptom onset must be over a course. Uh, it can all arise at the same time, basically. Um, you will also find motor neuron disease, which will give you a mixed patchy upper motor neuron and lower motor neuron pattern of weakness, as well as NMO, which is neuromyelitis optica. It is a mimic of multiple sclerosis. Then in lower motor neuron weakness, um, this slide is just for you to peruse, actually. So the structures I've listed um, are structures in the peripheral nervous system listed in order anatomically as they exit the central nervous system. Um, so you have anterior horn cells to your specific nerve root, your plexus, to your peripheral nerves, your neuromuscular junction, and your muscles. So lesions originating from any of these structures will give rise to lower motor neuron signs. So then, once you've identified a lower motor neuron pattern of weakness, the next thing you need to determine is if sensation is affected or not. So then, in lower motor neuron pattern of weakness with normal intact sensation, it will be used to, useful to identify the differentials in your mind according to where the lesion could originate. No, so neuromuscular junction disorders are such as myasthenia gravis and Lambert-Eaton myasthenic syndrome, and it will present with fatigability. And you need to remember in myasthenia gravis, the weakness will worsen with repetitive movements, while in Lambert-Eaton, the weakness will improve with movement. In muscular disorders, you will classically find raised muscle enzymes such as creatine kinase and listed below are um, the conditions that could lead to a lower motor neuron pattern of weakness such as polymyositis, dermatomyositis, your proximal my myopathy, myotonic dystrophy or alcohol and statin use. Lesions in the anterior horn cells such as polio and progressive muscular atrophy which is once again a variant of motor neuron disease will characteristically have fasciculations. So next, in low motor neuron weakness with affected sensation, it is most likely a nerve root or peripheral nerve involvement. Then ask yourself, what is the distribution? Symmetrical distal distribution should raise your suspicion of Guillain-Barre and GDS. Um, it can it, 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 it can be caused if you have a bout of infectious diarrhea or it can just come on its own. Um, you can find symmetrical distal um, distribution of weakness and sensation loss in diabetic or alcoholic neuropathy 
HIV, Trachomary 2, your cold equina syndrome, and remember in cold equina you will find bladder bowel dysfunction and it is a neurosurgical emergency. So then, if the weakness and sensation is not symmetrical or if it's, if, and if it's unilateral or if it's only affecting one part of your hands, arms or legs, it, it will point towards a peripheral nerve involvement or a nerve root involvement. So a classical example um, would be if a patient presents with foot drop um, and a sensation loss to the lateral side of the leg, you could be thinking about common peroneal nerve palsy. But to differentiate that from your L5 nerve root lesion, um, you need to ask the patient if they can invert their ankle. So if a patient has loss of ankle inversion, this would suggest that it is an L5 nerve root lesion instead. Because in common peroneal nerve palsy, you will have um, weakness in dorsiflexion, you have weakness in ankle eversion, but you are still able to invert your ankle. So this is just an example that you know sometimes you need to um, separate whether is this a peripheral nerve involvement or if this is a nerve root lesion. So then if the distribution follows a myotomal or a dermatomal distribution, it will most likely be a nerve root disease. And um, most common examples would be compression from a prolapse intervertebral disc. You also need to consider um, involvement of two or more peripheral nerves. So patchy involvement would suggest mononeuritis multiplex. And you can classically see that in diabetics, your vasculitis cases such as Churk-Strauss, um, HIV, amyloidosis, and sarcoidosis. So, so I hope I have not um, overwhelmed you with information. I hope this um, should cover a very basic approach to weakness. Um, so here are some key points. Upper motor neuron weakness can arise from lesions in the brain brainstem and spinal cord, lower motor neuron weakness can arise from lesions in your anterior horn cells, root, plexus, peripheral nerve, um, neuromuscular junction, or um, it could be a muscle disease. Your time course of your weakness will be helpful. So, for example, hyperacute presentations would suggest a vascular pathology, such as a stroke or TIA. Neurological examination would be essential to explore the underlying. Uh, sorry, would be essential to explore the underlying cause. So your reliable clinical findings, um, as I've said earlier, would include tone, reflexes, plantars, fasciculations, and fatigability. So examination of power and distribution would be intermediate signs, I would say. So then. Um, thank you for bearing this far with me. I hope that you have understood weakness a little bit better than before you started this video. If you feel overwhelmed, it's okay. Take your time. You can go back to this video, pause at different sites and understand the concept maps that um, we have created. So remember that these concept maps are not for you to memorize. These concept maps are to... Uh, it, it serves just serves as a guide to help your understanding in approaching common presenting complaints in this case um, weakness so then we would encourage you to create your own concept maps for different symptoms um, to think about what crossroads um, and what signs or symptoms you would look out for and rule out your life-threatening causes that will be important so we hope you enjoy this video. Once again, as I said, feel free to pause these videos at different stages of the concept map to see in detail. And I hope that this has helped you guide um, your thought processes. And I hope that it has helped you in your clinical reasoning as well. Thank you very much.